Okay, so for our next presentation, you know our, uh, know our presenter pretty well. Uh, he's been here at pretty much every single uh, conference from the beginning. Um, he has presented on magnetic energy secrets based on his uh, pretty much kind of a lifelong work in, in magnetics and engineering. Uh, I think for over you know, 25, 30 something years, worked as an industrial uh, electronics engineer, doing things at, at, at all scales. And he had a company um, for quite a few years with uh, pretty remarkable switching technology. A couple of people were asking about capturing, you know, these inductive spikes off a of motor, off of uh, uh, charged inductors and that kind of thing. Um, his circuits are faster and more precise and more versatile accomplishing that kind of thing than I think anybody has really ever seen. We're talking about like nanosecond switching times and high, high, high percentage of recovery. Uh, in these uh, magnetic energy recovery systems. He had like lighting control systems and these big monster transformers powering like thousands of watts of bulbs. You put your hand on it, it's not even warm enough to uh, keep a, a cup of coffee warm because they pretty much just run cold. Um, he's been involved with quite a bit of research with uh, Jim Murray, uh, working with him on some of Jim's uh, SERPs technology, switched energy resonant power supply, one year, uh, Paul and Jim um, co-presented on the secrets of Tesla's power uh, amplification concepts or magnification concepts. And there was you know, one solid state uh, demo. You plug it into the wall. It's lighting 50 watts of bulbs, but the net loss is only one watt. So it doesn't mean one watt is lighting 50 watts of bulbs. 50 watts of uh, electricity is lighting 50 watts of bulbs. And then being able to return like 49 to the source means on that cycle, there's like 49 watts worth of uh, work being done, being returned, which means you only actually lost one watt. And they took it to the next level and doing, you know, pretty much what's kind of considered impossible and took it to a gas generator where, you know, gas generator is going to be idling, but as soon as you hook up like, you know, 1,000, 1,500 watts of bulbs, it's going to bog down, start, you, you know, until it kind of picks up and it's going to start burning more fuel, obviously, to compensate for that load. And with the type of work that uh, Paul was doing with his switching circuits and Jim's concepts, able to you know light like 1,500 watts of bulbs, and the engine is idling. It doesn't even know there's a load attached to it. Uh, it's one of the most profound things I've ever seen. You know, Paul has really explored and pushed a lot of different areas beyond uh, what most people has ever done or seen. Um, anything that I've seen uh, from Paul over the years is absolutely legit. I've seen it over the years for the last 15 something years since I used to have a little health food store and when I first you know knew Paul and uh, uh, you know going over to a shop at his house and stuff where he, where he has his uh, motor technology and everything and the thing about it is is he's been uh, gracious enough to actually uh, spend the time and actually share this with everybody and if you look at some of the material he's put out. He's actually pretty much open sourced a, a, a lifetime's worth of work. Um, for this presentation, I know relatively recently he's been digging into some of the work of like Harold Aspet, Aspton. Is anybody familiar with him? Okay. And so, um, and, and some related concepts. And so what, what Paul wants to share with you, and, and it was earlier today when I was talking about the MWO, uh, he's the one that presented on the um, universal medium and his experiences and his whole path of building an MWO, which kind of inspired us, seeing the results, seeing the transformation Paul was going through, and um, having him also help to kind of coach and guide us along with Eric and Peter giving input, which really made the MWOs possible. And so a lot of, you know, debt of gratitude for, you know, all the, all the help. And all for the <laughs> cause, man. And so for this uh, presentation tonight, uh, this will be a 90 minute presentation, uh, and it's uh, Ether Weirdness. It's about time, magic batteries, and other observations. So help welcome Paul Babcock. Okay, now we're going into machines. All these machines I've seen Ether effects from, over Unity effects. They all have things in common. So, Newman, Bedini, Babcock, Mike and Norm Gray, Benowitz, I've had interactions with all the machines. Some of them I've actually seen work, some of them I haven't seen the grave work, but I've back engineered it. All the devices use DC electrical sources. All the devices use DC electrical switching. Some devices use electromagnetic coils with iron cores and magnetic shunts, and a magnetic shunt is an air gap. 
Some devices use electromagnetic coils with air cores. Reverse electromagnetic force, flyback, is always used and exploited. Some devices use a capacitive charge pump, and a charge pump is a switching process where you're exchanging joules back and forth between electromagnets and capacitors, but you're actually pumping the voltage up way past source voltage with the capacitors. Some devices charge batteries with flyback. Oh, and some devices charge batteries with flyback. Space has magnetic properties. This is all important, but a commonly known and exploited phenomenon. Space affects magnetic flux. Vacuum, it doesn't matter, air or what. Space has a poor magnetic path, but will store magnetic energy when magnetic flux is forced to concentrate in an area of space. When flux is concentrated in the center of an air core coil or an iron inductor with a gap shunt that concentrates flux into an air gap, the space becomes inductive, and this is very important, and now resists change to current flow. So how does something that doesn't have anything in it resist anything? As current increases in the inductor, the shunt will exhibit more Henry's. So what it's saying is, the more flux that I force into a given space, the more that that space will inhibit changes in current flow back at the power source that's providing that magnetic flux. Dr. Aspen was a mathematical genius who created a body of revolutionary work that should have rehabilitated the world of academic physics, but instead was ignored into obscurity. This guy's work has so blown me away because suddenly, like I say, it found me, I didn't find it. And this point I was making about space has magnetic properties. So as he's built this complete mathematical model from subatomic to galactic. His equations are simple, and when he says physics without Einstein, that's exactly what the fricky means. But it's just so common sense, and it blew me away. So I'm reading this, so it's going to take me 15 years to, to digest that book, and I ain't sure I got 15 years, and that's why the mouse army has to pick this up. That's what was Jack was talking. This is mouse army stuff. And so, he, right there, I'm reading his ether. He says, well, the reason science ignores ether is basically it's just for convenience. He goes, but the ether is obvious because space can store magnetic energy. And if it's nothing, how can it store anything? And then he said, as a matter of fact, and as he went through his equations, you have to understand that it's not just a little bit of energy. It would take this massive amount of energy for vacuum space to actually store and affect magnetic flux. Bang, I've been doing this stuff forever. And here this guy comes and just points it out, of course there's an ether. Staring me right in the face, could have punched myself. Of course. So these are, this is just a, if you boil it down, it's just very basic switching processes here. Newman, the Mikonor, and the Bedini, you know, they're all, you know, I'm, I connect, current's flowing, magnetic fields rises. You can calculate exactly how much energy is in that magnetic energy. At the moment you turn off, it's one half the inductance of the coil times the I current squared at turn off. That tells you joules. This switch opens, this one closes, that field collapses, and now it turns, its magnet, magnetism is translated back to voltage and electrical charge, and it winds up in that battery. So this joules came out of this battery, went to this field, went to that field, and then went back to that battery. And there's many variations, but this is basically the process. So science is gonna tell you, well, yeah, the resistance losses and the flux leakage, and you're never gonna get back out as much as you put in. Granted, I agree, but that doesn't mean weird stuff doesn't go on. So these three machines are all air core. And there are big masses of copper winding, so here's a Bedini unit. 
And don't explain, ask me to explain how this coil works because that's John's magic knowledge of ether physics. Here's the Mike and Norm machine. And here's the waveform. This is spinning right there when I took that picture of almost 8,000 RPMs. This is a 48 volt generator on it that's making about 180, 190 volts. And here's the switching circuits they built for it. And it never runs out. 